Good morning. Welcome to our service here at New Life Church in Toulon, Manitoba. Welcome to all those of you watching online as well. Thank you for joining us. Uh, it is a new year. We have the first Sunday of the new year, January the 7th. Uh, but more importantly than it being a new year, it is Ukrainian Christmas today. And so I know all of you have come bearing gifts for me because I'm your Ukrainian pastor. And we're celebrating Ukrainian Christmas today. Uh, and I want us to do the traditional Ukrainian greeting. So I'm going to say to you, Christos Ruzdaitsa. And you're going to respond back to me in Ukrainian, Slavite Yoho. All right, so let's do it. Uh, we'll do a practice run. Slavite Yoho. All right, Slavite Yoho. One more time. Slavite Yoho. Let's put some life into it, okay? Slavite Yoho. Good, good. All right, here we go. Ready? Christos Rush Diet. Slavite Yoho. All right, I know every Ukrainian in the world is happy this morning. Thank you for doing that for us. Slavita, oh yeah, I should, okay. Uh, Christ, is, Christ is born, and Slavita, Yeho, what you said is uh, praise him. Praise him, that's essentially what you're doing, saying is praise him. All right, we're going to praise him in prayer, let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this opportunity to gather together this morning. We look forward to a great day as we have gathered as a, a group of uh, uh, fellow saints together in the body of Christ. And we want to worship you today, praise you, exalt you, glorify you, magnify you, make your name known amongst uh, the entire world through our song and word. So we just commit this service to you. We ask your blessing on it. In Christ's name we pray. And everybody said? Amen. 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 All right. We've been again having some problems with our computer, our now our video projector up there doesn't work, so we're going to have to make a change using this one. Hopefully it'll all work. Uh, pray for us that we can get this all operational. So, uh, Crystal, uh, God bless you and, and, and music team. And uh, let's see. Oh, I've got to change this over. Well, let's stand together. Yes, there you go. Well, we're going to continue to praise him in song. And uh, with our voices and giving him glory because he's so worthy. <clears throat>
praise. Amen. You may be seated. All right. Thank you, music team, and uh, thank you for your prayers. Uh, we're hopefully going to get everything operational here with these <coughs> excuse me, computers. We're getting new computers, so hopefully we can resolve some of these problems we are now having. We're going to have a different service this morning. It's going to be the order service is going to be totally different, so just be aware of that. And uh, uh, we're going to uh, uh, have a uh, an unique structure to it. We're going to uh, uh, carry on with our service with receiving the offering. And those who are going to be uh, taking up the offering, would you come at this time? And I will pray God's blessing upon the offering as we give it. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we're so thankful for many blessings that you pour out on us. We think of the financial blessings you give to us. And we're able to earn money. Thank you for healthy bodies. Uh, that we're able to go to work and make money and then bring it to you as part of our first fruits of our labor. And we just present it to you with love and, and gratitude and adoration. May you use it to build your kingdom for your glory. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, this morning uh, we're going to have a change. And one of the changes is our pastoral intern, Ian Wynn, is going to be helping me with the announcements. And so Linda has retired. And uh, he and... You're not quite as good looking as Linda, I have to say that. No, I'm definitely not. <laughs> yeah, definitely not. But uh, we'll put up with you. And uh, so tell us about, you made a trip out to Brandon this week. Yes, I, uh, I had a chance to go to Brandon to baptize these two young adults here. They are, uh, I met them actually at camp and, um, and, and they were very inspired by just following God. So they reached out to me to baptize them. But not only that, they text me almost every day for advice and stuff. So... It's pretty encouraging to see that they're willing to follow God. Um, and not only that, these two young guys right here. So the first one's Carter. The other one's Lucas. They're, uh, Carter's 16. Lucas is 17. And, um, and they, they started something in Brandon, and it's called Exalt. So it's pretty much a worship night where they get a bunch of, of youth ch just to come out and just, just to sing praises to God and just to worship him and to join together in prayer. And the first one they had, they had about 150 people. And the second one uh, the, is the one when I went to Brandon to baptize ties them. They had double the amount of people. And if you guys were there and hearing them sing and dance, like I, I, I think Brandon had an earthquake that day. <laughs> like I, I was hoping the church would not collapse, but it stood. It stood. So, but yeah. Um, and then yeah, we'll show you the clip right here of um, my experience. Yeah, so that's a clip there for you, and all of, and even the band too. They're all volunteers. Um, they all they all know each other, so they all just come together and decide. You know, let's let's make this night happen, and it's great to see that they're able to do that to work around their not only their um, their their university schedule, but they're also their high school schedule too. So to make all this happen, so I'm really proud of them, and yeah. Um, I didn't see you dancing there. No, uh. <laughs> I was sitting at the back observing them and appreciating all the work that God's doing. <laughs> right, yeah, I, well, Linda and I heard it at home. Uh, we just stayed at home and heard it. Yeah, I wish I had the energy there that those guys were uh, uh, showing. All right, our Christmas project uh, comes to a close. We want to thank you for the donations that each of you made towards our project with the orphanage, which is Bethel Rays of Hope in Kenya. And we received $1,895. Uh, we are forwarding the money to the uh, orphanage. And the folks at Stonewall said to say thank you. Uh, they were very pleased with the amount of money that came in, and this will go towards building that new classroom that uh, they have on the uh, works. All right, so starting January 21st, sorry, January 1st, uh, our church is now accepting e-transfer. So you can send a donation to the email right there. And the donation is going to, and if, and if it's going to like a specific area that you want to donate to, please specify in the comment area so we know where to put that money to. And if you have any questions, please contact Catherine uh, or email her just right up there. 
All right, uh, we have this coming Saturday a full day that we hope to get this church cleaned up after Christmas and some of the work in the basement. The kitchen is uh, getting almost to the point of being ready to be used and so a lot of work is going to be done. Uh, we plan for the uh, period of time, there you see 9.30 till 3.30, but if you can only come for an hour, that's great. Uh, come for an hour or if you can come for the entire time, we'll provide lunch. And uh, that is this coming Saturday, uh, 9.30 till 3.30. All right, so what that means for Men's Donut is that it's being pushed back a week. So the Men's Donut now will be on January 20th at 10 a.m. So if you guys want to just get together, uh, share some donuts, uh, and just pray for each other and encourage each other, I ask you to come. And then the ladies are having a spa night Monday, January the 22nd here at the church, 6.45 p.m. And you notice there are some of the details. Uh, they ask you to register before January the 14th, phoning uh the church here and letting us know or signing up on the bulletin board at the back. So there you see all the details. Uh, a question mark there with the cost. And Sharon, uh, it's, it has a question mark. Uh, is, I'll, I'll know later. Okay. It depends on how many people show up. Okay. And there's a sign-up sheet. The more, the, the more, the cheaper it'll be, right? Yeah. All right. So, <laughs> all right. So lots of ladies come. Make it cheap. All right. Good. Thanks. Uh, any other uh, points there? Okay, invites. Yeah. Good. All right, very good. Thanks, uh, Sharon. All right, so every Sunday morning before our service, we have a pre-service prayer. So if you would like, please come join us at 9.40 a.m. in the basement. Just walk around and just uh, pray for his presence to be here and to basically just block out the enemy as we uh, continue on to worship him in the church. Now, we don't have any janitorial service here at the church. We just do it by volunteers, and we encourage folks to take a week and help clean up. And uh, there's a sign-up sheet on the bulletin board. If you have questions with regards to that, see Debbie, uh, our church administrator. She can give you the details for that. All right. So the New Life Young Adults Fellowship finally started yesterday. And it, it was absolutely amazing to see the people coming out. Um, currently, right now, we are going through the, the book of John. If you are interested in uh, coming to Young Adult Bible School, Bible study, uh, please, uh, we're meeting every every other Saturday at 11.30 a.m. So we'll start with worship at 11.30 a.m. And the Bible study starts at 12. So if you'd like to come for the worship, come earlier. All right. And next Sunday, uh, we're carrying on a theme of prayer. I'll be speaking on that topic this morning. And I'm calling it adding fasting to your prayer life. Mm -hmm. And on January 21st, uh, we have the privilege of having my friend Caleb. It's not a great picture of him, but I will find one for you guys, um, of, of coming here to preach for us. Uh, he is also a student of Henry at Miller Bible College. Yeah, he College. was in my class in evangelism yeah. that I taught. Yeah, awesome, awesome person. And he's, he's has, he has been a huge encouragement to me to where I am right now. If it wasn't for him, I probably wouldn't be standing up here. So uh, I'm looking forward to see him preach for the first time uh, here at this church. So please be welcoming and be nice. <laughs> And also for youth, youth group announcement, we had a great time last week. I figure since I was coming back from Brand, I just drove straight to Tim Hortons. So we got some nice donuts um, on Friday and we played some games. And this week, we're, uh, we are joining on, on Friday, we're joining with the Stonewall group to do a worship night there. So uh, yeah, so Catherine and I will be giving them rides. Um, and if you guys have know any kids or if you guys even want to come along too for worship night, you guys are more than welcome to come. Uh, meet up will be at 6.15 and we will leave at 6.30. And your kids will probably be home by 10. All right. Thank you, Ian, for helping with the announcements. Let's give them our appreciation for a good job. <laughs> All right. Uh, kids story, Jesus praise. Stories of the Bible. Jesus praise. This is Jesus, hey who is the Son of God and the Savior of the world. Jesus was going to Jerusalem to celebrate. And Jesus and his disciples were having the Passover meal together. Jesus told them many things of what was to come and the trials they would face. Then Jesus looked up to heaven and prayed for himself, saying, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son so he can give glory back to you. 
I brought glory to you here on earth by completing the work you gave me to do. Now, Father, bring me into the glory we shared before the world began. Then Jesus prayed for his disciples and said, I have passed on to them the message you gave me. They accepted it and know that I came from you, and they believe you sent me. He prayed for his disciples who would be staying in the world after Jesus went to heaven. He asked God to keep them safe from the evil one and to make them holy. Then Jesus prayed for all the people who would come to believe in God because of the message that the disciples would tell. He prayed for people of all time, even to this day. He prayed that followers of Jesus would be united so that the world would believe that God sent Jesus to die for their sins so that everyone could be with God forever. During Jesus' time on earth, he prayed a lot. He knew that prayer would keep him close to God, his Father. Sometimes Jesus would pray with others, like when he asked Peter, James, and John to come with him to a mountain to pray. Other times, Jesus would leave his disciples and pray by himself so he would have time alone with his Father. When Jesus prayed, he prayed for all sorts of things. He prayed for his disciples, for those in need of healing, and for little children. Jesus even prayed for us and asked his Father to watch over us. That's right, Jesus prayed for you and for me. Through Jesus' prayers, we can learn how to pray too. Jesus used the Lord's Prayer to teach his disciples to pray. It wasn't long and fancy. He showed them that they could pray in a simple way about many different things. Our prayers can be the same way. Jesus also taught us that we should pray without giving up. God is always listening to what we say. The way he answers our prayers might be different from what we expect, but we can always trust his plan for us. So the next time you're happy or sad, or worried or angry, or just need help, talk to God about it. He listened to his son's prayers, and he'll listen to yours too. There you go. A little bit in addition to the uh, children's story today from another angle. We're going to pray the Lord's Prayer together. Let's pray this, at this time. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Scripture reading this morning is Psalm 16, verses 1 through 11, and Emily Green is coming to read the passage for us from the New International Version, Psalm 16, verses 1 through 11. Be to me faithful, God, for in you I take refuge. I said to the Lord, you are my Lord. Apart from you, I have no good thing. As for the saints who are in the land, they are the glorious ones in whom is all my delight. The sorrows of those will increase who run after other gods. I will not pour out their limitations of blood or take up their names on my lips. Lord, you have assigned me my portion and my cup. You have made my lot secure. The boundary lines have fallen for me in places, in pleasant places. Surely I have a delightful inheritance. I will praise the Lord who counsels me. Even at night my heart instructs me. I have set the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will rest secure because you will not abandon me to the grave, nor will you let your Holy One see decay. You have made known to me the path of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence, with eternal pleasures at your right hand. Thank you, Emily, for leading us in our scripture reading this morning. One of the practices that I had for many years while I was pastor at Stonewall was to begin each new year with a focus on prayer. And prayer is something that most of us as Christians make a part of our lives, especially perhaps when we are in need of help. I like this cartoon the little boy says to his dad as he's getting ready for bed, do I have to say a prayer even if I don't need anything? 
Perhaps you heard the story of a little boy who was being mischievous in church, and finally his exasperated mother yanked him by the collar and headed into the foyer to give him some much-needed guidance on his life. And as she was dragging him out of the sanctuary, he was heard to yell out, Pray for me! Well, perhaps that's an experience you had when you were a kid with your mom and dad. I know that happened for me. More than once I got disciplined when I got home uh, from church for being bad in church. Another little boy was asked by his pastor if he prayed every morning and evening. And he said, no, not mornings, just evenings. And the pastor asked him, why is that? And he said, I'm not afraid in the morning. Well, the fact of the matter is, the Bible says that when God's people pray fervently, his power is released to accomplish much. The prayer of a righteous man and a righteous woman, we would add for sure. It's understood there because the generic man is used here the righteous person, is powerful and effective. One person has made made the statement this way, prayer on earth invokes the power of God from heaven. And so this morning, being the first Sunday of the new year, my message will focus on the topic of prayer. We're going to look at a particular area, and that is the area of prayer for guidance in life. And being that it's the first Sunday of the new year, we begin a new year, we need to come to God and receive guidance in our lives. Psalm 5.8, the psalmist puts it this way, lead me, O Lord, in your righteousness because of my enemies. Make your way straight before me. In uh, Psalm 24, the psalmist puts it this way, show me your ways, O Lord, teach me your paths, guide me in your Truth and teach me, for you are God, my Savior, and my hope is in you all day long. And so I have entitled my message this morning, A Prayer for Guidance for the Future. <clears throat> Excuse me. And as we prepare uh, to uh, look at what the scripture has to say about this, let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for the opportunity that we have this morning to gather together and we look at the topic of prayer and specifically prayer for guidance. And as we begin a new year, we look forward to the uh, 360 some days that are left in our year, the opportunities that these present to us. Lord, we need your guidance. We, it says in the Bible, it is not within uh, a man himself to know his way. We need direction. We need guidance. I pray that you will lead us in the right paths, and we come to you asking you for that guidance. This morning I stand against all the forces of darkness, command every evil spirit in the strong name of Jesus to go. Holy Spirit, I welcome you here. Guide and lead us into the truth. May the Lord Jesus Christ and God the Father be magnified. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. A young man was in love with two girls, two women, and he couldn't decide which one of them he should marry. And finally, in desperation, he went to his pastor for counsel. And uh, when the pastor asked him about why he was uh, uncertain, he said, well, one of them is a great poet. And he said, the other one makes delicious pancakes. And he said, those are the features of each of the girls. And he said, I don't know which one I should marry. And the pastor said to him, oh, I know what the problem is. You can't decide whether to marry for batter or for verse. Well, there's many decisions in our lives that each of us need to make as we go through our lives. Things like, uh, obviously, in this context, whom to marry, where to live, what courses to take at school, what jobs to apply for and take. Uh, should I take that high-paying job at MWG Ventures? Should I uh, uh, start working for the, this wonderful man uh, who runs MWG Ventures? Well, the best help that we can have in making the right decisions obviously comes from God. And we can access that guidance through prayer. Psalm 27, verse 8, the psalmist puts it, You have said, seek my face. And my heart says to you, your face, Lord, do I seek. But be, uh, as we talk about guidance, I want to suggest to you there's two problems that I first want to address before we look at how to get that guidance from God. And the first of those two problems is the problem of not asking for guidance from God. 
You know, it is within the nature of the way that God has created reality that we do not know what the future holds. Um, knowledge of the future and what it holds is something that God has withheld from us. No one knows the future. All of us anticipate, but we have no knowledge of what's coming down the pike for us. Deuteronomy 29, 29, the secret things, and he's talking about here in the future, belong to the Lord our God. James 4 puts it this way, come now, you say today or tomorrow we will go to such and such a town and spend a year there and trade and make a profit. And then James makes this admonition. He says, yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. You have no way of knowing. You can make the best of plans, but those plans can be immediately and totally disrupted in a split second. And that's why he goes on to say, if you, if you make these plans, always add the phrase, not only just verbally, but do it mentally, if the Lord wills. Lord willing, I do it. Uh, <clears throat> another passage from Ecclesiastes chapter 4. No one really knows what is going to happen. No one can predict the future. It's interesting to watch uh, people making all sorts of predictions for the year to come. And uh, it's interesting always to watch last year's predictions and to see them now. Uh, the vast majority of those predictions are totally awry. Well, because we don't know the future, that means we do not know how to make the best decisions in and of ourselves. The passage I alluded to earlier on, Jeremiah chapter 10, verse 23, I know, O Lord, that the way of man is not himself. It is not in man who walks to direct his steps. And what that's saying is you don't know. You don't know what's the best for your life. You may think you know, but in reality, you do not know because you're finite. You're limited. You're not omniscient. You don't have all knowledge. Only God has all knowledge. You have limited knowledge. And as you anticipate your future, you have no way of knowing what's coming down the road. And so given that fact of our humanness and our inability to know what lies before us, obviously, we should be turning to God for guidance. But sadly, many people, even Christians, do not consult with God on those decisions. They rush madly into the future without ever coming to God and asking him, should I be doing this? That's a great tragedy. There's a story in the book of Joshua where God had told the Israelites to not make treaties with any nation in the land of Canaan, the new land they were entering, the promised land. And uh, by a ruse, a group of Gibeonites who lived in the land came very deceptively and tell, told the Israelites that they had traveled a long way. They said their supplies had been new when they had left home. And by the time we got here, they said, look at our bread, it's moldy. And the scripture says that the men of Israel sampled their provisions, but notice, and I italicized the next phrase, they did not inquire of the Lord. And Joshua made a treaty of peace with them to let them live, and the leaders of the assembly ratified it by oath. And if you go out and read the rest of that story, it goes on to say that that becomes a real problem because a few days later they find out, hey, you know, this, these guys are part of the uh, our neighbors. We were not to have made treaties with them. And the people turn against the leader and say, what are you guys doing? And the problem was, they never checked with God first. Never checked with God first. And I've seen this over and over again as I've pastored for many, many years. People plunge into all sorts of things without ever consulting God on the matter. They think, I'm going to buy this house. I'm going to take that job. And they just move on without ever asking, should I be doing this? God, do you want me to do this? Which is a very wrong thing for a Christian to do. Now, the question that I have is, how do I decide what to consult in God, uh, uh, with God on? And obviously, there's a myriad of decisions that we make day by day that wouldn't be all that crucial. You know, it really doesn't matter whether you use Crest or Colgate. Uh, it really doesn't matter whether you wear brown pants or blue pants. It really doesn't make that much of a difference. Those decisions are inconsequential. And uh, though I do want to say this, so when it comes to the matter of clothing, let me just add this. 
there is one area you should consult with God on. And I especially want to address those of you who are the fairer sex on this, and that is on the issue of modesty, although it applies to us guys as well. 1 Timothy 2 verse 9 says that uh, the command is that we're to dress modestly with decency and propriety. And a question you should ask yourself before you wear something, and indeed before you even buy it to wear it, is this modest enough or will it cause one of my brothers in Christ to stumble? And I just say that as a kindly reminder to all of you. Take that in, 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 into consideration. Now, here's the decisions you do need to pray about. And that is when the decision you make has an influence on the direction of your spiritual journey. Because you see, as you move through life, you can go a right way or you can go a wrong way. And life stands before you and decisions, multitude of decisions need to be made. And some of those decisions you make will take you down a right path. Other decisions will take you down a wrong path. And so that's why we consult with God. And when you consult with God, the scripture promises, Isaiah 30, 21 puts it this way. Your own ears will hear him. Right behind you, a voice will say, this is the way you should go, whether to the right or to the left. And I find that that's to totally true. Is that I pray and ask God for guidance. All of a sudden, I get this, uh, uh, I hear God say to me, don't go that way, go this way. And he is faithful to give us that guidance and direction. And so I suggest to you this morning, and not suggest, I encourage you, I can't command you, but I encourage you anyways, make it a practice of your life to turn to God in prayer as you make each of those decisions. I encourage you to do this. We see this was the case in David uh, when uh, he was fe facing various challenges in life, such as the story that's told in 1 Samuel 23 of the Philistines fighting against the uh, Israelite community of Keilah, kind of like what you have with Hamas fighting against Israel today. And it says, therefore, David inquired of the Lord, should I go and attack these Philistines? And it says, and the Lord said to David, go and attack the Philistines and save Keilah. And, and in this case, yes, you got to deal with the people who are attacking you. Very good application in our current situation with what's happening in Gaza. Um, when you have a decision to make, never make that decision right on the spot. Always take a time to pray about it. Back in the church in Stonewall, I, did, I was involved over many years. So we, we had there, like we do here, a congregational ministry team, people who led the church congregation. Other churches call it the board. We call it congregational ministry team here and, and in Stonewall. And uh, we would oftentimes ask people, would you serve on this? We had what we called a nominating committee. And I would be oftentimes asked to uh, ask potential candidates who would serve on this area. And I would go up to the person, and I made this my practice, and I do it to this very day, is I would always say, don't say to me yes or no on the spur of the moment. Until you have prayed and asked God, should I take this or not? And I, I would go on to give the counsel, only accept it if God wants you to. And I would always say to them, if he doesn't want you on the same team, neither do I. I don't want you on this job. Uh, if God doesn't want you to do it, neither do I. And so you pray before you decide. Linda and I always pray before we go on our shopping trips. And uh, I know that while I'm praying, Lord, for, uh, we always pray for safety as we travel. Boy, that certainly stood us in good stead, many a uh, close scrape and accidents. And then we also always pray for the gut purchases uh, that we're going to make. And uh, while she's thinking about Winners and Laura and uh, Melanie Lynn, I'm thinking about, you know, Home Depot and Canadian Tire. But that's where we're heading, to those places. And I am convinced that praying before we buy has saved us a, from a lot of bad decisions on our part and has protected us. I like the way Proverbs 13.21 says, Misfortune pursues the sinner, but prosperity is a reward of the righteous. You'll make right decisions in your purchases if you pray before time. The second problem is seeking guidance from wrong sources. 
And we can make the mistake of turning to the wrong place for direction and guidance. And one of the biggest challenges in life is knowing who to go for counsel to make the right decision, especially in critical points in our lives. It's interesting that Scripture calls Jesus in prophecy in Isaiah chapter verse uh, uh, chapter nine verse seven, and he talking about Jesus will be called Wonderful Counselor. All right, so if you want somebody who gives you good counsel, there's a wonderful counselor out there. His name is Jesus. Psalm thirty two, God promises, I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you and watch over you, and we can benefit greatly from the guidance and counsel of spirit-filled people, believers in Jesus. Back when I was about two weeks before I was to get married to Linda, back in uh, 1971, and there were still dinosaurs around, uh, going around the earth at that time, and when, uh, two weeks before, I remember uh, before getting married, I got a case of cold feet. Would you believe that? It's, this is a true story. This is not almost true. This is totally true. And uh, so I went to talk to my two older sisters, Natalie and Elsie, about my struggle. And I asked them, you know, I'm not sure if I'm doing the right thing in marrying Linda. What should I do? And so I wanted some counsel for my very wise older sisters. And uh, I'll never forget their response. Uh, Natalie, my older sister, said to me, Henry, listen to us, marry her. And Elsie, my younger sister, said, yeah, you're getting a better deal than she is. And having been married to her for, what's that, 52 years, I agree, I've gotten the better deal. Now, the danger is seeking out counsel from ungodly people. Psalm 1-1 says, blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly or stands in the way of sinners or in the seat of scoffers. In other words, you don't want to be listening to what other people tell you who are ungodly. That's what it's saying. Um... Because getting the wrong counsel can so easily lead you off the path that God would have you to walk. For example, you can have secular counselors who will tell you, you know, it's okay to have premarital sex before you get married. You know, how is it going to know? You got to try yourself out. You know, you don't just kick the tires. You get in the car and drive around the block a bit. And uh, that's the counsel you'll get. Or, or uh, as uh, the counsel that King Rehoboam got in, in Scripture and it says he got counsel from the young guys. They gave him the wrong counsel, the bad counsel. You want to stay away from that. Uh, you, you'll have people who will encourage you that if you're having marriage problems, instead of working those problems through, going for good Christian godly counseling, you immediately think, oh, I'm going to separate, I'm going to divorce. And you'll get that kind of counsel from people on a regular basis. And I want to suggest to you that if you're giving counsel, you have to be very careful because you can give counsel that is wrong and God will hold you accountable for that wrong counsel. It says, brothers and sisters, not many of you should become teachers. In other words, telling other people how to live like I'm doing right now. You know that we who teach will be judged more severely. In other words, the moment you tell somebody, oh, leave that bum, you're responsible before God for giving that counsel. If God is saying, no, you stay. Get it? Matthew 18, Jesus said it would be terrible for people who cause even one of these little followers of, to sin. Those people would be better off thrown into the deepest part of the ocean with a heavy stone tied around their necks. We have to be so careful that the counsel we give to others is in line with God's word. Be very, very careful what you encourage other people to do. And then secondly, there's an even more dangerous source of guidance, and that is through the occult. And I need to stress this to you this morning. Have nothing to do with the various forms of divination that come from satanic sources. We call it the occult. And the Bible tells us to completely avoid any involvement in the occult. Deuteronomy chapter 18. Do not let your people practice fortune telling, use sorcery, interpret omens, engage in witchcraft, cast spells, or function as mediums or psychics, or to call forth the spirits of the dead. Anyone who does these things is detestable to the Lord. Occultic activity is a blasphemy against God. Why? Because you are going to Satan for information for your future or how to uh, proceed in life that you should rather be going to God for. And so that's why Isaiah says in chapter 8, verse 19, someone may say to you, let's ask the mediums and those who consult the spirits of that. Let's, let's check up on the tarot cards. 
Let's find out. Let's go to the uh, palm reader. And with their whisperings and mutters, they will tell us what to do. But notice what Isaiah says. Shouldn't people ask God for guidance? Should the living seek guidance from the dead? In other words, you're going into a seance. Uncle John doesn't know what you should be doing. Guidance from these sources is totally destructive and will lead us astray. And that's what had happened in the case of Samuel. He went to see the witch at Endor, and uh, he asked uh, for uh, him, for, for this witch, her, to bring forth someone that she was going to ask. It was called necromancy, contacting the dead. And the Bible very clearly says that that's something that Saul should not have done. And it says, so Saul died for his breach of faith. He broke faith with the Lord that he did not keep the command of the Lord and consulted a medium seeking guidance. He did not seek guidance from the Lord. Therefore, the Lord put him to death and turned the kingdom over to David, the son of Jesse. And if you are involved in any form of the occult, I say this to you, stop. Confess it as sin immediately. Not only confess it, but renounce what you've done already. And in the name of Jesus, say, I renounce every activity and occult involvement. Whatever those have been, renounce it. Now, obviously, we should be seeking guidance from God. God desires clearly that we would come to him for our uh, counsel and for guidance. Proverbs 8 says, And now, O soul, listen to me. Blessed are those who keep my ways. Hear instruction and be wise. Do not neglect it. Blessed is the one who listens to me, watching daily at my gates, listening at, beside my doors. For whoever finds me finds life and obtains favor from the Lord. And he who fails to find me injures himself. All who hate me love death. And the reason we are smart to go to God for direction is because he is omniscient. And the word omniscient, omni, means all. Uh, science means knowledge. He knows everything. Isaiah uh, 46, 10, I have known from the end, from the beginning, from ancient times, what is still to come. My purpose will stand, and I will do all that I please. And what that means is that God can see the future, and he knows in the future your potential problems ahead of time that you and I cannot. And those things in the future are blocked from us by the very nature of the way reality is. We don't see the future. God's not limited in that way. God knows what the future holds. God knows where the, uh, the pitfalls for you are and will direct you away from them. Um, and over and over again, the scripture tells us that we're to come to God for guidance. If anyone lacks wisdom, let him ask God who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given him. And then his wisdom will guide you in the choices in your life, what you should be doing. The wisdom of God is what you are seeking for in your life. And so because of this insight, those who avail themselves stand to benefit greatly. I mean, imagine you have $10,000. <clears throat> And you want to invest this $10,000, and you want to know in the future what stocks would be the best to buy, which ones will go up, which ones will go down. And even though, uh, even that, not, yeah, with that knowledge, you can then make those decisions. Well, obviously, you don't have this ability to look into the future what stocks to buy. Although I heard the story about the fellow who was walking along the beach and the waves. Uh, uh, washed up a lamp, and he picked it up and rubbed it, and out came a genie. And the genie said to him, you can have one wish. And he said, I want a copy of the newspaper dated one year from today. And the genie said, why? And he said, so I can see uh, how the stocks that I'm trading in now will be doing a year from now. And, of course, this advanced foresight would be very helpful. It would be kind of like being in the American Congress and knowing um, what the um, uh, uh, stocks are going to do, then congressmen benefit from that kind of insight. Well, anyways... Uh, uh, the finger snapped from the genie, and bang, he autom automatically saw himself a year down the road, and, uh, and uh, there he had a paper from a year from now, and he went to the financial page to see how his stock was doing. He looked at it, and he decided, okay, this stock is here and the rest of that, and he made his decision on which stocks he should buy, and then by chance, accident, he flipped to the last page, and there he saw the obituary with his own picture on it. Well, that kind of insight is not available, obviously, to us. But it is. Oh, it is. And it is through God's guidance. 
some years ago, I was driving this old car, and it was uh, it had lace curtain fenders, and uh, uh, it was good for um, you know those cars that they used to have uh, that had smoke behind it blocked the view of the people following them. Well, that's what I had, and I was driving down the road, and uh, um, I remember saying, "Lord, I need a new car, and I don't have much money, and I need a new car." And I was driving from Selkirk to Stonewall on, on, uh, on Highway 67, across what we used to call the bog and coming closer to Stonewall. And as I was coming to number seven and, 67 and number 7 Highway at the intersection there, back in those days, this was about 1977, uh, there was a, a um, car dealership there called Stonewall Dodge Chrysler. And uh, <clears throat> a guy by the name of Arnold Bell ran that uh, uh, dealership. And as I came up to uh, the stop sign, there wasn't lights at that time, there was a stop sign there on number seven highway, and as I'm standing at the stop sign to cross number seven highway, uh, as I'm praying, all of a sudden, I hear the Lord say to me, uh, drive in here, I've got a car here for you. And so I pulled into the parking lot, and uh, one of the first things I saw was the car, four years old at that time, a 1973 Pontiac Ventura. And uh, it was on sale, uh, $1,900, that's what the price was. I bought it and uh, traded in the old car, bought this car, paid $1,900 for it. I ended up driving that car for 19 years. I put on 100,000 miles on it. That's about 160,000 K. And then in 1996, I sold it for scrap. Remember one of the guys from Stonewall helped me tow it to uh, Interlake Surplus in Gunton to Jim Poole's place there. And I sold it for scrap, and I still got $100 from it for that. And I figured it out that it had cost me less than $100 a year to drive. And I remember one time I was witnessing to a non-Christian, and I was telling him, you know, God, when you get to know God, he will guide and lead you in your life. And I told him this story. And I said, and, and look at that. I said, here's this car. I drove it for 19 years. Um, actually, I gave it to uh, my son, Curtis. He drove it back and forth to university after uh, some years and, and uh, uh, used it extensively. And I said, as, as I said, look, look at how well it worked out. And the non-Christian said, well, how could you lose it with a reference like that? <laughs> well, that's true. Let me say this. Pray before you, what? Decide. Pray before you decide. Isaiah 58, 11, the Lord will guide you always. He will satisfy your needs in a sun-scorched land and will strengthen your frame. He will be like a well-watered garden, like a spring whose waters never fail. And once he shows you the path to go, you need to do this. Be sure to have a genuine desire to obey and do whatever he shows you. And when you pray, thy kingdom come, you're really saying, not mine. Thy will, not mine, be done. And what you want is your heart to be in line with the heart of God. That's what you want. You want to get such a communion with God that your heart is sinking with God's heart. And as you pray for guidance, make sure to submit to God and everything. As you do, uh, say to God, thy will be done, thy, uh, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. You will experience God's fullest goodness to you. And I would say this, if you don't, rest assured, it will not turn out good for you. I'll, I'll guarantee you that. Living for 75 years, I've seen it over and over people's lives. Those who follow the Lord, turns out good. Those who don't, there's always some snafu in their life. Now, I'm going to stop right here, and we're going to do something very different today. <clears throat> there's a story in the New Testament where Jesus went into the temple and began driving out the buyers and the sellers. And he made a very interesting statement. He said, it is written, my house will be called a house of prayer but you've made it a den of robbers. And what he was talking about, of course, was the temple there, the old covenant uh, place uh, under the old covenant where the Holy Spirit dwelt. And uh, the building there was called a house of prayer. Well, in the New Testament, really where we gather together, that's our house of prayer. And I would suggest to you, why don't we turn this church building today into a bit of a house of prayer? And I want to conclude this service here by taking some time and having a prayer time. And uh, you may need prayer for guidance. You may need a problem you need to pray through. And we're just going to do it. You have the option of just sitting quietly by yourself. Don't want to put anybody under any pressure. You don't have to pray out loud. 
uh, in front of the group just by yourself, or you can do it as a husband and wife, as couples, uh, or you can gather together in small groups. But I want you to take a little bit of time just to pray. And we're going to turn the rest, a good chunk of this service, and then we'll conclude with a worship time after that. And so uh, I'm going to sit down beside my wife, Linda, if you can come and join me. We're going to sit at the front. We're going to pray together, and um, uh, you decide how. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are stilled, when striving cease, my comforter. My all in all, here in the love of Christ, I stand. In Christ alone, who took on flesh, fullness of God in helpless space. Righteousness, scorned by the ones he came to save, till on that cross, as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied for every sin on him was laid. Death of Christ, I live. There in the ground, his body lay. Light of the world by darkness slain. Then bursting forth in glorious day. I 
understand. And while the guys are doing that, I'm just going to uh, uh, have a prayer time um, uh, for us and um, trusting God to uh, meet the needs of our church. So he and if you would do that, I will pray. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we want to say thank you this morning for the fact that you are a God who cares for us and loves us and has the best in mind for us. And uh, as you promised us in the scripture, I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you and to give you a hope and a future. And we think that what a wonderful promise that is. You're not out there to destroy us, to make our lives horrible and, and unhappy, but to bring them to the fullness Jesus said, I've come that they might have life and they might have it to the full. And we thank you that you do that. And we know that part of the battle is simply surrendering our wills to you. I know that in my life I fight with this all the time, wanting my own way, wanting to guide and lead myself in the direction I should go. And I acknowledge that that is wrong, and I repent of it in my life. And may all of us do the same thing here as a church body that we would surrender to you and to your purposes and your plans. We give you our lives. We want to be uh, living for your purposes. Forgive us for the times when we have not in the past. And we now recommit ourselves to living for you and for your purposes, for your glory. And pray that the year 2024, whatever it holds in store for us, will be a year of great advancement for your kingdom in our lives. And in our church, we long to see this church become everything that it should be. Thank you for the way you've led us in the past, in 2023. Thank you for bringing he into us and in, in 2023. And now yeah, he's uh, working as our pastoral intern. And how wonderful is that? We thank you for providing for that need for us as a church. And guide and lead us in that regard uh, as we look forward into the future. Lord, we don't know how long you have before the second coming of Christ. You told us. We're to keep our eyes on the eastern skies, to always be aware that in a moment as such as you think not, the Son of Man will return, and we look forward to the second coming, and maybe that'll happen in the year 2024, maybe even in the month of January, maybe even this coming week, maybe even this afternoon, but whatever it is, whether it's today or down the road, whenever we want to be a living for you, serving you, so that when, we, when you return, we will not be ashamed We will not be embarrassed by the lives we live, but we can look forward and meet you with joy and and happiness. So we thank you for this opportunity to worship you and praise you like this through prayer. And um, we pray that now as we gather uh, and, and do our worship time through music, you will be honored and glorified. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. All right, we're going to ask uh, the music team to come, and we're going to conclude our service with a time of Worship through music. Let's stand together.
darkness flows from your veins. Your kindness shown in all your ways. We sing, God is so good. Your God. Worship His love. 
we're going to have the benediction, and then once the benediction is over, I'm going to ask the band to sing and play that last song for us. I want you just to sit in quiet meditation, and then when the uh, band is finished with the song, then uh, the service will be completed. Thanks for coming. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Thank you.